In this video, I'm going to be unpacking why I do not buy rentals and why you should not buy rentals if you are just getting started in real estate and you want to start making money in real estate. Not only am I going to unpack three big reasons why you should definitely not buy rentals and why I don't buy rentals, but by the end of the video, I'm also going to share with you the three things that I do do, do do, in real estate. Obviously, we have bought houses before, but I never use them as rentals. You might want to consider doing one of these three things instead if you want to get started in real estate making money. If we've not met before, my name is Jason Baca. I'm a real estate investor in the state of Pennsylvania. I still have a day job. I got a wife, five small kids, a busy life just like you do. And over the past couple of years, I've been able to do a handful of deals on the side all of which I've done without any of my own money, etc. We've made multiple six figures in profits, which has been going really well, and none of them have been by buying rentals. <laughs> in this video, I'm going to explain the three things that we do do and uh, why you should st avoid rentals, buying rentals as a beginner in real estate, if the whole goal in getting into real estate is that you actually want to make money. So uh, I drop videos every single week to get you up and running to start making money in real estate. Click subscribe. Click, click subscribe to the channel. Uh, I drop videos every week to help you get uh, financially free and making money in real estate. All right, let's just address the elephant in the room. A lot of times when you are just getting into real estate, again, I'm qualifying my statement here, okay? Because we talk about real estate as if it's like just one thing, like real estate. But within the world of real estate, there are like so many different ways to make money, which are all completely different businesses. And they're all have completely different things that you're selling and completely different customers and completely different business models. But we talk about real estate as, as if it's all one thing. So allow me to disqualify you and let you off the hook as far as buying rentals. If you, if this is true about you, then go ahead. Buying rentals might be something you want to do. If you have a really super strong income and you don't actually need any money from real estate, especially right away. Number two, you have some savings set aside that you can tap into some cash savings if you needed to in order to pay for your rentals, right? Either to pay for repairs or e either to pay a mortgage while you're waiting to find a tenant or uh, any problems that arise. If you have a super strong income and you don't actually need income or money from the real estate and you have savings on top of you know your income to be able to afford things that might and will go wrong with your rentals. And number three, really all that you're concerned about is maybe long-term wealth building or depreciating your taxable income. If that's you, then yes, you probably can and should buy rentals. I mean, it's a good investment vehicle. If you don't need the money right now because you have a strong income, you got plenty of savings to weather the storm that are, that's going to come with rentals. And the only real reason why you're getting into real estate anyway is just to kind of build long-term wealth and maybe cut down on your taxes, then rentals might be for you. If, however... You are not getting into real estate because you have a strong income and you got plenty of cash savings and really you're just trying to build some long-term wealth. If you're getting in real estate because you want to make money right now and you want to get wealthy right now and you don't have a big emergency fund savings and that's what you're trying to build up for yourself and for your family through real estate, then eh, do not buy rentals because that is the exact opposite of what you're going to get, right? Ask me how I know. <laughs> Everybody who I know who has gotten into real estate to try to make money for them and the, for their family and wanted to make money right away, who has then gotten into rentals because they thought or they were sold something on YouTube or whatever that, that that's the way that you go, always has regretted it. Like anybody I know that's like a mom and pop landlord hates being a mom and pop landlord. Okay, so here's the reasons why. We're about to jump into it. Here's one big reason you might not want to get into rentals. Number one is... There is no upfront money. There is no upfront money. I, I, I don't know what you've heard on the internet, but when you buy rentals, you do not make a bunch of money upfront. You usually spend a bunch of money upfront, right? You spend the money to buy the property. You spend the money to rehab the property or renovate the property. You spend the money to hold the property. You spend the money to find a tenant to you know, turn over the property, etc. And eventually, the idea of like an investment is like planting a seed in the ground that eventually it will yield fruit. And that is mostly true through appreciation, which means that uh, you're gonna, the house is going to be worth more in the future just because it exists, basically. Uh, depreciation, you're going to be able to decrease your taxable income. Uh, the cash flow, 
which is the net difference between your expenses every month and what you're actually bringing in every month, right? The cash flow, which is usually minuscule and a lot of times gets eaten up by big expenses that come down the road, right? Those are the three. And then of course, debt pay down, which is the, there's a mortgage on the property. As you have your tenants in there, they pay down the, the property, right? But think about all of those four things that we just said. The only thing that you could say happens like right away is the uh, taxable income, decreasing your taxes, which again, will not be until the following year, whenever it is that you file taxes and may not be as much as you think, depending on you know the, the speed at which you're, you're depreci depreciating the property and depending on what your income is. But that's the only thing that's going to happen like, quote unquote, right away, meaning within the first six or 12 months, right, is maybe you can write off a little bit of the rental in uh, the rental expenses or rental property, actually, on your taxes, right? I'm obviously not a tax lawyer. The other three things, how many total? Three things, in addition to the depreciating your taxes, the ways that you make money with rentals all take a very long time to happen, right? Appreciation, meaning the property is worth more in the future than it is right now. Yeah, over time, you know, occasionally you see these big leaps and bounds like coming out of uh, 2020, 21, like inflation and everything skyrocketed and some some properties like doubled in value. They were worth 150. Now they're worth 300 or even more. But that's very rare. A lot of times it, it's very slow and incremental over years worth of time. You will eventually have a property that's worth more than what you paid for it. Right. The debt pay down takes a long time because Whenever you get a new loan, uh, I, I don't want to get too caught up in the weeds here, but whenever you get a new loan from a bank, most of it goes to interest at first. Most of your payment, let's say your payment is $2,000 a month, like $1,990 of that goes to interest and only 10 bucks goes to the principal amount that you actually owe, right? I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's how it is. It, it's, it's, it starts off very interest heavy and then gets very principal heavy at the back end. So yes, it will pay down the debt eventually, like 15, 20, 30 years from now, right? You might refinance at some point and kickstart the whole thing all over again. But yes, your tenants will pay down your debt for you eventually, like a long time from now, 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 right? And then cash flow. When the property is actually cash flowing best is when you don't have any debt on the property at all, which can take a long time to pay off all that debt if you even want free and clear property to begin with. And even if you're making $300 a month in cash flow, you get to the end of the year, that's $3,600, right? But then, uh-oh, something happens in the property, like the roof is starting to leak or the water heater goes out or there's a big plumbing problem in the bathroom and it's leaking water to the, to the bottom floor and it's gonna, you're, you're going to eat up your cash flow in trying to maintain the property. Or a tenant trashes the place and then they, they move out. And it's going to take you a couple months to figure it out to or to uh, clean it all up and then go find a new tenant. Or even worse, the tenant doesn't leave and they stay in the house, but then they, they stop paying you payments. And then you have to go through the whole eviction process and you got to pay lawyer fees and all this kinds of stuff. That cash flow can get eaten up really, really quickly. Even if you're building it up for a year, two years, three years, something can come along five years later and boom, just wipe out all the cash flow that you just had over the last five years, right? So the reason why you may not want to get into rentals if you're just trying to get started in real estate making money is that there is no money up front, right? There is no immediate payoff. There is no money up front. Rental property will cost you money up front, and then it will pay you through those four ways we just described eventually. And it probably in the long run, depending on the property and the market and all that sort of thing, it probably will be a worthwhile investment for you long term. But again, qualifying statement, if the reason you are getting into real estate is because you want to start making money right now, then you do not want to buy rental properties because there is no money right now, right, in rental properties. So that's big reason number one. Big reason number two, again, I'm, I'm going to finish up this video by telling you the three things that I do do. Uh, and so no, big reason number two, you might want to avoid rentals if you're just getting started off, is you taking on all the risk. You take all the risk by buying the property and holding the property and owning the property. You also take on all the risk that is associated with that property, right? You t Not only the risk of management, not only the risk of tenants not paying you, people squatting in the property, but people damaging the property, right? People suing you because they were walking down the street and they slipped and fell on the sidewalk in front of your house and they half fell on the sidewalk and they half, half fell in your yard 
And now the parents of the kid who slipped and fell and hurt himself are suing you because you're the property owner. Like whenever you own the house, you're actually going to own the house and hold it long term. You are taking on all of the risk of all the things that could happen, all the liability that could happen with that property, right? As opposed to the three things we're going to talk about here at the end. So just keep in mind, there's no money up front. And if you're actually going to buy and hold and keep the property, you also have all the risk that's associated with owning that property. I'm going to try to cruise through these because this video is going to get super long. And big reason number three, before we get into what you might want to do, big reason number three of why you should, I shouldn't say shouldn't, right? Do what you want. Do whatever. Only you can really decide. Only you really know your situation. But big reason number three why you might not want to get into rentals if you're just getting started in real estate to actually make money is that mo properties, mo problems. Mo properties, mo problems. There used to be an old song in the 90s, a rap song that's mo money, mo problems. I think it's actually a kind of a cliche these days. Mo money, mo problems. Well, in real estate, mo properties. Mo problems. If you want mo problems in your life, just buy mo properties because mo properties will lead to mo problems. What kinds of problems, Jason? You might be asking. Say, tell me, Jason, tell me about these problems. Well, the financial risk, like we talked about, you could have the problem of a tenant who doesn't pay you, right? They move in and then they don't pay you and you have to go through an eviction process. Where I live currently in the state of Pennsylvania, that is a nightmare to have to go through the court systems and evict and it takes a long time and then there's like a 30 day thing and then you gotta wait another 45 days and then you know if you're living in a state like Texas or something like that, it might be a little bit of quicker, but it is still a problem that you will have to deal with, right? Now you, you might be saying, Jason, what if I just hire a property manager? I can have a property manager do all of these things. That's fine. You can hire a property manager, but number one, you're going to have to pay for it. So it's going to eat into your cash flow, right? It's going to cost you money. Again, it costs you money to get rentals. It doesn't pay you money. It costs you money, especially up front. And then number two, you still have to manage the property managers, right? Like whenever there are repairs that need to be done, whenever there are problems, you still have to be, keep your eye on the ball. You still have to be paying attention. You still have to approve their spending. They can't just go put a new roof on the house for $10,000 and then say, you know, and withdraw it from your bank account or say you owe us $10,000 if you didn't approve it. Like you still have to manage it at some level, right? Even though they're, they might be collecting the rent, they might be serving an eviction notice to somebody. It's still your headache. It's still your problem. It's still your property. So it's still your problem. And when you have mo properties, you have mo problems. Uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife Kelly and I were talking about this recently. We have five kids. I don't know how many kids you have. We have five. And they're all still really little. And what we found is one of the hardest parts of having five kids is just simply that there are five kids, that there are five of them. It's just the volume of the kids. Because all the kids that we keep having, we're, uh, you know, have, have five at this point, they all might be experiencing a problem at any point in time that we, the parents, have to address. You might have one who's sick. Right, and they need certain care. You got one who needs a ride to go here or go there. You got one who's a baby still, and they're throwing a tantrum. You got one who pooped in their pants, and you got this one who's coloring on the wall. Right, but it's all happening at the same time. So if you only had one kid that pooped in their pants, it's easier to manage because it's just one kid. Right, it's a little poop in the pants. Whatever. If you just have two kids, one is a little bit sick, and the other one's coloring on the wall. You can kind of figure it out. You know, maybe the mom does this and the dad does this and you tag team it or whatever. But once you get to five kids that all have problems and are all mommy, 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 daddy, 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 all at the same time, it can feel overwhelming, not because any one thing that they need is overwhelming. It's just that it's all happening at the same time and you have to deal with it all at once. Well, five kids... Imagine having five properties that all have five problems, right? And really the only way to scale and really, really build wealth and make money with rentals are to have a lot of them, right? To, you got to have a portfolio of rentals. But with all the portfolio of rentals comes a portfolio of problems because <laughs> more properties, more problems. Again, if you're like the person who I described at the beginning of this video who has a strong income and you don't need the money from the real estate and you have a nice cushy savings to be able to pay for these things as time goes and you really are just in it for the long-term wealth building, then rentals might be exactly what you want to do to build a, a portfolio of rentals. If, however, you are like me, 
and you got into real estate because you want to start making money now, because you want to start blessing your family now, providing for your family now, accomplishing goals right now, then you're not going to want to do rentals because there is no upfront money. When you do buy rentals, you take on all the risk. And the only way to really grow and scale is to keep adding more properties. But the more properties you have, the more problems you have. So hopefully I've officially talked you out of buying rentals and making the mistake. Uh, fortunately, I've, I've had some really great mentors in my life. I've not gone that route, not made that mistake. I did have to deal with it. We actually had to evict a tenant one time, though, because we bought a house that had a tenant in it. And um, it was, it was uh, what's the word? Cordial? Kosher? Uh, congenial? That's not the word. I don't know, remember the word. It was okay, is what I'm saying. It, she did not like the fact that she had to move out, and we literally did have to post the property, and here's your eviction notice for not paying, because she, she basically just stopped paying rent as soon as we bought the property from the landlord. Um, so it, it ended up being, what's the word? Uh, mutual? Cooperative? Collaborative? That's not, that's not the word. It ended up being amicable. Is that what I'm thinking of? Uh, so in the end, but it was a process. Like I had to talk to her. I had to kind of deal with her. She left the house in not great condition. Um, you know, obviously she didn't pay us for like two months. So it was two, <laughs> two months where she just felt fine. Just like not paying, like, yeah, I'm just not going to pay you, you know? And, and we had to like go, th we had to serve her a notice and do the whole thing. And so even though I've technically not had any rental properties, we bought a property that was being rented and unfortunately had to evict somebody. So I had just a little taste of, of what it tastes like to have rental properties, and um, it wasn't fun. So instead, as I promised, here's three things you might want to do. These are the things that I'm doing, and some, some that I'm already doing, and some that I'm now starting to do in my real estate career, where you do get paid up front, where you really don't assume any, or at least not very much of the risk, and you can mitigate meaning lessen the amount of problems, potential problems that you experience while making money in real estate. The first one you're probably familiar with, which is called, oops, nope, buy and hold. That's not right. Hold on, scratch that. Okay, we're back. Sorry, I apparently didn't like finish all my notes before I hit record to record this video for you. First one is wholesaling, not buy and hold. I literally just got done for 15 minutes telling you not to buy and hold. Wholesaling. What is wholesaling? Wholesaling is you find a property, you get it under contract at great price or great terms, and then you assign that contract to someone else who's going to step in, buy the property, and basically assume all the risk, right? Who may want to hold it as a rental. Wholesaling, the reason why you make money up front is because you get paid at closing. Unlike a rental property that will pay you eventually, wholesaling, you get paid right now. Right now, you get paid right now. Right at closing, you get an assignment fee, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 25,000, 30,000 dollars for an assignment fee for finding the deal. Now watch what happens. You get the property under contract when you're wholesaling, right? You're gonna find someone else who's gonna step in your place basically and actually close on the property, and actually buy the property, and you collect a fee for basically finding a really great deal for that person who's actually gonna buy it, right? You get paid up front, you don't have any risk whatsoever associated with the property because you're not actually buying the property, right? Somebody else is going to buy the property in your stead in the contract. And as far as problems are concerned, there's really no problem that can happen that's really going to be that big of a headache. The only problem that you might in if run into is that you got the property under contract for a price higher then you probably should have, right? So you get the property under contract for $200,000. You do your due diligence. You get your cash buyers in. You realize the most that they're willing to pay is 180. And then you have to kind of go back and renegotiate. Maybe the seller decides to cancel the contract, etc. But again, even if you or the seller cancels the contract and you can't renegotiate it, this is no real risk, right, to you as far as like losing a bunch of money. Maybe your earnest money deposit, depending on how it is that you structured the deal in the first place. But that's literally it. So, you know, you get paid up front. You really don't have any risk because you're never actually owning the property. And there's only like one or two things that could go wrong and that are totally avoidable if you're doing it right in the first place. Wholesaling is a really great way to get into real estate. To, to learn the ropes of real estate and to get paid up front to make money now so that you can pay your bills now and feed your family now as opposed to buy and hold rentals, which are not going to do that for you. Wholesaling. The another one that you could do is called wholetailing. 
This is similar to wholesaling, um, but is completely a misnomer, right? Why anybody calls this wholesaling, I don't know. That's just, I'm not the boss of real estate, right? People, these, these terms come from somewhere. The reason why it's confusing to call it wholesaling is because there's no, there's nothing about it that's wholesaling. It, they're trying to like blend the two words, wholesale and retail, wholesale, but there's nothing about it that's wholesaling. So the term actually doesn't really seem to make any sense. Wholesaling is basically you are going to buy the property, but you're then just going to basically clean it out and clean it up, right? You're just going to clean it out, clean it up. Maybe this is usually off market, by the way, uh, not dealing with real estate agents. You're, you're direct to seller off market. You're actually going to close on the house, buy the house. You're going to clean it out, clean it up, make it presentable, and then you're going to sell it on the retail market with a real estate agent, usually, right? So it looks like this. You say, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, uh, I'm going to buy the house from you for $100,000. Then you actually buy the house, right? So you either have to raise $100,000, you need a partner that's going to give you $100,000, or what I always like to do is structure a creative finance deal where you are going to owe them $100,000 later, right? It's called seller financing. The, the person's going to seller finance the house to you, but the deed is going to transfer to your name. You're going to legitimately own it. Like you're going to own the property. You're going to take however much time it takes, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days to clean the house out, clean it up, hire a real estate agent who's then going to put it on the MLS market, the retail market for you, and you're going to find a bank finance cash buyer. So you're basically finding a property off market. You're closing on it ideally with creative financing so that you don't actually have to spend any money out of pocket. Uh, you're having it cleaned out, cleaned up, or honestly, you could do the work yourself depending on how big the job is. I've done a lot of work myself. I don't like doing it. I'd rather pay somebody to do it. But if you have to, you have to, right? Like on some properties I've done, I've just had to. I had to go over there with the broom and the dustpan and the mop and the squeegee and the thing, and I had to clean the house up myself. Well, I shouldn't take all the credit. Me, my wife, and uh, some of our family members, we have like cleaning parties at houses. We just go clean them out, get it done in a day or two, and then it's done. Um, but if you can pay somebody, just pay somebody. It's well, it's well worth it. <laughs> so you clean it out, clean it up, and then you sell it on a retail. A really smart thing to do, by the way, pro tip, if it's possible, if the seller's negotiable, is to, let's say, let's say it's $100,000, just create a $100,000 note or a mortgage that they can hold against the house that you will pay, not in monthly payments, but you will pay in one lump sum later down the road after the house has sold. So basically you close on the house, you owe them $100,000. That gives you time to clean it out, clean it up, put it on the market and resell it. The next person comes in with a bank loan of $150,000. You pay your sellers off their 100, you get to keep the 50 in between. But you didn't do any rehabs, you didn't do any uh, renovations, you didn't fix anything, you didn't repair anything. You're looking for wholesale properties wholesale, you're really just looking for properties that are one clean out and clean up away from being market ready, which are actually more than you think. You you see a property that is like a hoarder house and maybe there's like, it's just really dirty. There's a bunch of animals there. People have been smoking in the house. It's just not, it's not very clean. But honestly, if all you did was just clean all this stuff out, vacuum the carpets, etc., it could be a fine livable house. It may not be on HGTV, right? It's not going to be this master beautiful flip, but somebody could buy it with bank financing in your market. Then that's the perfect candidate for a whole tail property. So wholesale means you're not actually buying the house. You're just going to assign the contract to somebody else. Whole tail means you are actually going to buy the property, basically just clean out, clean up, and then retail it with a real estate agent. And then last but not least, my personal bread and butter, how I've made most of my, all my money so far. I say that like I've made a ton of money. You know, It's been multiple six figures, but I'm not like you know some big, huge... I'm not like exactly crushing it out here. Like I said, I still have a day job. This is just kind of on the side in a handful of houses we've been able to do. But this is what we've done, which are notes and mortgages sometimes called a wrap note. In fact, I should have put that because that starts with a W. Wholesale, wholetail, and wrap. They would all start with W. Man, I should have done that. But notes and mortgages. Basically, how do notes and mortgages avoid some of those three big pitfalls of rentals? Because that's what we're comparing and contrasting here, right? The rentals are no property, no money up front. Uh, what did I say earlier? Uh, you take all the risk and there's a bunch more problems. Well, the cool thing about creating a note or a mortgage, if you're if you're not familiar with creative financing, it's okay. I'm about to explain it. Is basically you're going to resell the property to someone else 
who's actually going to own it. That's why you're able to make money up front and you're not really assuming a lot of risk. So let me just break down a deal that we did one time. So we bought a property subject to. Subject to means we're going to take over the mortgage payments for the person. They're going to leave the mortgage in their name and we're going to become the new owners of the property. We're buying the property. It's getting deeded over to us and the mortgage is going to stay in their name. You may ask, who in the in the right mind would do that? Why would anybody keep the mortgage in their name and deed the property over to you? Uh, click the link below. I'll, I'll drop a video where I explain the whole process and why anybody would do it and things that you need to say if you want to pitch uh, subject to um, to a potential seller. Okay, so we bought this property subject to. Then, which one should I pick? Um, I'll do my most recent one. So it's kind of like a wholesale, sort of. Um, so we bought a property subject to for this particular property. Then we cleaned it out, cleaned it up, right? And then we, no, that's not a good example because we sold that one cash. We're talking about notes and mortgages. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, different property subject to, we bought it. The guy was starting to fall behind on his payments, right? He was going into pre foreclosure. We stepped in, took over the payments for him. The house deeded over to us. We become the new owners, right? And what we do is we then resell that same house with the underlying loan in place with let's say the guy's name was josh with josh's mortgage that's still in place that house it was about one hundred and fifty thousand, is what the mortgage was for and we resold it to a new buyer at one hundred and sixty-five thousand. so it's about 15 that give or t i'm using round numbers to make it easy if you've heard me tell this story before in other videos you're going to say you said it was one hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars, jason Yes, it was technically $167,000, but for the sake of easy math, let's say it's 165. So we bought it at 150, we resold it at 165, that creates a $15,000 spread, but when we resell the property on seller financing, creating a wrap note, creating a mortgage, that person is going to come give us a down payment, right? In this case it was about $10,000. So they're putting $10,000 down, right, which we collect up front, so that's just money in the pocket, so you make money right away. And then uh, there, that person's monthly mortgage payment is about seventeen fifty, and the underlying mortgage to Josh's mortgage that we still owe, that's still in place, is about thirteen hundred. So thirteen hundred and seventeen fifty, the difference is four hundred fifty dollars a month. Now this is not the same kind of cash flow as a rental property because a rental property you have expenses because you have to manage the property because you own it. But with a wrap and a mortgage or a wrap note or a mortgage deed of trust, if you live in a, live in a deed of trust state, the, the difference is that $450 that's coming in, if you sell it on a wrap note, is true, pure, passive income. It's true cash flow because you are just the bank on the house, right? You don't own the property. You resold it to the next person on a wrap mortgage. They have the property now. The deed is in their name. If something goes wrong with the, the house, the toilet clogs or the sink breaks or whatever, it's their house. It's not your house. You're just the bank. No more than you would call Chase Bank if you know the front porch light went out and you you, you know you had to fix it. Like Chase Bank is not coming to change the light bulb, right? Like a landlord might have to come change the light bulb or fix the lights or whatever. If you're the bank, you don't assume any of the risk of the house because you don't own it anymore. All you have is the deed or the uh, deed of trust or the mortgage, right? And so that's how we've been able to make multiple six figures for the most part. I'm just now getting into wholesaling, which is pretty cool. Uh, more to come on this YouTube channel documenting that journey. But this has been the bread and butter so far is basically to buy a house, clean it out, clean it up if it's needed. In this case, the one I'm telling you about didn't even really need hardly anything. The guy was just in pre-foreclosure. You know, he's going to lose the house anyway. We stepped in, saved him from, from foreclosure, and the house was already kind of perfectly fine and livable, so we just resold it without doing anything to it. Um, collected that $10,000 down payment up front in the pocket, and then now have been cash flowing 450 bucks a month, pure uh, truly passive income since then uh, with equity still in between the two notes. So 1750 comes in, we pay the 1300 out and we keep the spread in the middle, but we don't have to worry about fixing a water heater down the road because it's not our water heater because you know we didn't do it anymore. So I hope this has been helpful to you and that you've been convinced or at least you've at least been cautioned to think through should you actually buy rentals if you're just starting out in real estate and your whole purpose in getting started is to actually make money, you might want to consider wholesaling, wholetailing, or doing some creative finance wrap notes deals first to build up your bank account and get money coming in. And then when really all you're concerned about is 
is um, depreciating your taxable income and building long-term wealth, then maybe you want to buy a rental property. Uh, if you want to know about my very first fix and flip that I accidentally kind of fell into and did, go ahead and click or tap this video right here. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe before you go, and I'll see you in the next video.